Okay. Thank you, Mr. Town Manager. Uh, Councilman Peltier, would you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance tonight? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for its stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> Thank you, Councilwoman. And uh, I see Sue's on. Sue, if you could take the roll for us tonight, please. All right, Councilor Biggs. Council um, hang on. I think I could saw him. <laughs> he is, he's muted. Oh. There we go. Okay, Councilor. <laughs> we got you. <laughs> Okay. We could have not told you and just had you do that all night, but. <laughs> all right, Councillor Flanagan. Here. Councillor Forrest. Okay. Um, Councillor Hill. Here. Councillor O'Connor. Here. Councillor Pelletier. Here. Councillor Pentelo. Here. Deputy Mayor Mazzarella. Here. And Mayor Rell. Here. Okay, thank you. And I apologize, I kind of jumped the gun there a little bit. I just wanted to welcome everybody to the Monday, February 1st uh, town council meeting. Uh, I appreciate everybody uh, being here. I'm sure with the snowstorm, you've either been outside uh, enjoying it with your kids, having a remote school day or a remote work day or like some of us out already hitting the uh, driveways and uh, sidewalks already. So um, I hope everybody's been safe out there today. Um, you know, as always, things uh, go a little haywire during snowstorms, but uh, you know, I can say uh, of the utmost confidence in uh, not only Sally and her team, but uh, all the uh, town staff for um, making it to, uh, to work today and providing services to um, our residents. So uh, my hat's off to you and to uh, our town staff. So uh, I appreciate that. <clears throat> Tonight, uh, councilors, we have uh, um, Board of Ed Chair uh, Chuck Carey on uh, the Zoom with us, as uh, well as uh, Superintendent Mike Emmett. Um, they're going to talk to us kind of just I wanted to get a, a, I know we're going to be hearing a lot from them in the next uh, month or two when it comes to uh, budget discussions. And, uh, you know, I, I look forward to those conversations. I look forward to the workshops and, and working with you guys on those. Um, but for right now, we kind of wanted to have uh, uh, you guys present to us, uh, uh, you know, your plans. Uh, I now know that uh, um, I think there's a reopening plan that's in place. Um, starting later on this month, uh, we have been uh, remote learning, as, uh, you know, hybrid remote, as well as, uh, you know, in four days and, and out on Wednesdays um, since September. But um, kind of wanted to hear from you guys some of the plans, what you've taken into consideration and, you know, consulted with. I know uh, um, Charles Brown from Central Connecticut Health District has, has weighed in. Um, as well as others uh, on the decision. Um, but kind of wanted to hear from, from you, Mr. Emmett, on, uh, on the plans going forward and uh, you know, what we're gonna expect for our schools uh, in the next month or two. Uh, thank you, Mayor Rell. Good evening, uh, council members, uh, Town Manager Evans. Uh, I'm very pleased to be with you here this evening uh, to provide you with an update on where we are with regard to the um, school system and uh, reopening. Um, as you know, um, our school system uh, shut down completely on Monday, March 16th. Um, it was due to shut down for a period of two weeks. Uh, that two weeks stretched into the remainder of the 2019-2020 uh, school year. Over the course of the summer, uh, we had a reopening committee that looked at a variety of different options from a full remote option, a hybrid option, and a full reopening option. Um, in the latter part of July, on July 23rd, uh, the state offered us the uh, flexibility to be able to open up in a hybrid model. And that was the decision that was made. 
Um, so the Weathersfield Public Schools started the 2020-2021 school year in a hybrid model for um, grades pre-K through 12. Um, we saw a low um, level of infection in the fall. Um, so we began the process of looking at a broader reopening, which we had planned out to begin in early November. Uh, it was a phased approach and it encompassed elementary, middle and high school. Um, the, probably the second into the third week of October, we started to see the infection rate really start to take off. In consultation with uh, Charles Brown from the CCHD, I made the decision to hold off on uh, a broader in-person learning option. Uh, one of the reasons for this was we had done a survey and found that only approximately 16% of our parents had opted for full remote. So we had a large number of families that had anticipated being in. Um, as you have seen, uh, the infection rate in Weathersfield and in the greater Hartford area really took off uh, through the holiday season. We had two instances over the course of the fall where we had two buildings actually have to go full remote uh, due to a large number of staff members that were either A positive or B quarantined. At our peak uh, in the fall, at one point in time, the Weathersfield Public Schools had 365 people quarantined. That was staff and students. Uh, I am very pleased to say that we have gotten through the holiday period and we're starting to see the numbers come down. So, Typically what happens on a Monday, I'll get the um, email from Charles Brown with the cross check, the number of cases that were positive that were reported to the CCHD over the weekend. Today was the first day in probably the past four months where I did not have, have any cross checks coming from the CCHD. I had a total of two cases over the course of the weekend. Both of those cases were staff and both were traced back to family spread. And that's another one of the things that we've looked at over the course of the past four months. We have not seen the spread of infection coming from the schools. Uh, it has been community spread. We've seen it from youth sports. We've seen it from family gatherings. Uh, we saw a significant spike after the Thanksgiving holiday. Uh, and then we saw a, a milder spike after the Christmas holiday. So it has definitely been a, um, an issue where it has been community spread. So in looking at where we're at with our numbers and in consultation with uh, Charles Brown, as well as the Department of Public Health, uh, we meet with them every Tuesday morning at eight o'clock. Uh, we've made the decision to um, start with a phased in approach where we will welcome back our students uh, pre-K through grade three this coming Monday, February 8th for a four uh, day a week in-person learning experience. On Monday, February 22nd, students in grades four through six will make their return to a four day a week in-person learning experience. We're gonna hold off right now on middle and high school because we wanna make sure we're able to successfully phase in elementary first. But we do have a plan in place for middle and high school to bring students back by team at the middle school as well as by grade level at the high school. So that's certainly something that's gonna be happening uh, in, in the near future. One of the reasons that we want to maintain that Wednesday remote day, it's really twofold. It is an opportunity to allow our custodial staff to uh, do cleaning when we don't have students in the building, as well as the fact that we're looking to utilize a Wednesday to conduct a vaccination clinic for staff. Um, that is one thing you might have seen. Uh, educators are part of phase 1B, albeit not yet. It's only those members of our uh, employment community that are 75 or older or our nurses. So at this point in time, we have all of our teaching staff queued up into the, uh, ready to go into the VAM system and we're just waiting for the okay. Once those staff members are loaded in, uh, we expect to be able to do a vaccination clinic in conjunction with the CCHD. We'd look to do that on a Wednesday during a remote learning day so we can bring staff into the high school. Um, I will say that the reality here right now is that vaccine is uh, difficult to come by. So it's not going to be something that we're going to see happen immediately. Um, our hope was to be able to do a, a vaccination clinic early in February. At this point in time, the latest uh, figures from the DPH uh, peg teachers being able to open up into the VAM system probably late this month or early March. So that is a factor that we need to consider. A couple of the other factors we're looking at, obviously the new uh, uh, strain of the virus, uh, obviously is something we're taking a look at. Uh, Charles has talked about the fact that our mitigation strategies will protect against this new strain, but the new strain is considered to be much more transmissible. So it's something we're gonna to have to take a look at. 
The other piece of data that we have is we've done a survey with regard to our families with remote learning. And what we've seen um, through holiday season and even into the new year, we have seen an increase in the number of families that have opted for remote learning. So we believe that our students coming back to in-person learning are not going to be coming back to a full classroom. Uh, the option for a full remote for families will remain in place, we anticipate through the rest of this, uh, this school year. So um, obviously mitigation strategies are going to continue to be a uh, strong factor. Uh, mask wearing is going to be the key piece. And I will say without a doubt, our students and our staff have been exceptional in being able to maintain those masks, keeping them on and um, keeping a safe space. Um, certainly the social distancing uh, component, we will see a change in social distancing. We will continue to maintain six feet where at all possible, but we know full well with our classrooms being as they are, um, we are going to see a decrease in the amount of um, social distancing. So that's where we have to make sure we raise our, our game with regard to the other mitigation strategies. Again, mask wearing, uh, hand hygiene, and again, a shout out to our physical services department that has been absolutely great and making sure that we have all types of materials in place from soap for hand washing, uh, mobile hand washing stations that we had out at our playground so students could wash hands after recess. Um, we partnered with the town with regard to our COVID relief funds to purchase uh, Clorox machines for our buildings. So we have sanitizing machines at all of our buildings where we can uh, sanitize at, at a moment's notice. Um, so we're in good shape with regard to that um, type of mitigation strategy. Uh, again, moving forward, uh, my hope and my expectation is, is we get kids back into school. Um, it's been a long time. For some of our students, they've been out since March, and we certainly want to uh, make sure that we get them back in. But the bottom line is we're going to try and do it as safely as we possibly can. So as we've said to parents already, this plan will be flexible. Um, if we see numbers begin to escalate or if we're finding that we are having a large number of staff members have to quarantine or are becoming ill, we may need to make adjustments. So that's something that flexibility is going to have to continue to be there. Um, and again, I think the idea here is bringing kids back in as safely as possible. And um, we've got a lot of work to do, obviously, with regard to social emotional learning and reacclimating our kids to an in-person experience. Um, and again, at the uh, middle school and high school level, the um, process will happen over the course of this next month to take a look at what the numbers look like. Um, for those of you who might be high school parents, uh, winter sports have just started. Uh, that was something that was held off until January 19th. So we have done uh, practices for the past two weeks. We're expecting uh, competition to start in earnest uh, next week. So we're very hopeful that we'll be able to get in an abbreviated winter sports season. Um, we've had a couple of cases reported already uh, among sports teams, but nothing that has gotten to the point where we've had to quarantine an entire team. So. Again, mitigation strategies are going to be critically important with regard to um, sports. Um, at the elementary level, we're still holding off on doing after school activities in an effort to allow our custodial staff to have full access to the building. We're also really limiting um, community events in the buildings so that the custodial staff have full access to the buildings for cleaning. That's a key component. So again, moving forward, we're looking to make sure that this is a safe reopening. We're certainly looking forward to welcoming our kids back. Um, I will say too, there is a level of fear and anxiety among staff. There's no two ways about that. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that. But again, we're doing everything we can to make sure our mitigation strategies are in place. And uh, we look forward to seeing our pre-K through three coming back on Monday. So I'd be happy to answer any additional questions that you might have. Great. Thank you, Mr. Emmett. Uh, Councilwoman Pelletier. Um, I, I just have a question about the middle and high school uh, students returning. Um, do you have like dates where they're planning to go back full time or are you just waiting to see how the elementary goes first? Thank you for the question. Yeah, we're waiting to see how elementary goes first and looking to see if there are any issues there and then we'll expand out for middle school and high school. One of the things we're looking at at the middle school level is um, by team. So that's uh, one of the ideas that we're looking at there. And then at the high school level, our high school administration has asked that the first grade level that comes back are our seniors. We wanna make sure that our seniors are prepared for graduation. We have approximately 277 seniors uh, some of whom we haven't seen since the beginning of the year because they've been full remote. 
So I want to make sure that we don't lose anybody, and uh, they would be top the top to come in. And then followed by uh, freshmen, uh, as as well beyond that. I understand like phasing in like at a, any given school by grade, but why can't you start with elementary, middle, and high school? You know, phase them all in at once. I just. I, I just feel like the kids have been out of school for so long and I don't know what the rationale is behind doing only elementary and then only, you know, middle school or whatever order you go in with the other two, but. Yeah, I, I can tell you that what we've seen in terms of the student cases most recently, the bulk of the student cases we've seen at the high school level, followed by the middle school level. And again, in talking with Charles Brown, he felt it most appropriate to phase in at the elementary level first given the fact that there was more mass compliance, there was a greater level of cohorting being able to be done, and there was less likelihood that students would be out socializing outside of school. And again, I have to say, we've seen at the high school level, uh, that has been a, uh, a pretty regular occurrence. Thank you. I'm, I, and I just also just wanna say, I'm, I'm really happy that you are moving forward with um, getting the kids back to school. It's, mm -hmm. it's about time. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilman Hill. Thank you, Mayor, and uh, thank you, Mr. Evan. We do appreciate all that information. Um, thank you, sir. Regarding the vaccination for teachers, um, will that include uh, all staff, like custodians, paraeducators, secretaries, or is it, is it just teachers at this point? It includes everyone. That's a great question, Mr. Hill. Um, so uh, launch aides, uh, uh, crossing guards, paraeducators, uh, school secretaries, school administrators, classroom teachers, everybody's in. So well, everyone who's underneath the Board of Education umbrella, essentially? That is correct. Okay. Yep. And um, regarding, uh, it, it was excellent to know that, uh, well, not, you know, it, it's nice to know that the, the transmission and spread had been done by community and not through the schools, which is, I assume that your your that goes to compliance. Um, can you talk a little bit about how, you know how you can determine that you know that it's through the community and not through the schools? Is it the mask wearing? Is it the social distancing? Is it the, the cohorting? I mean, can you talk about that a little bit? Sure, I'd be happy to. Yeah, what what we've seen when we have a, a positive case, uh, Mr. Hill, what we'll do is we'll do contact tracing. And that's done with the CCHD as well as our nursing supervisor, Chloe Bobrowski, and the um, school administrator. So what we'll do is it's like we become detectives when we have a case. So we're looking to see you know, when the last contact was um, for a positive case, whether or not we have to quarantine. And we're looking back to find out where, where the source of the infection may have come from. And what we have seen, especially around holiday time, is the student will end up becoming positive. When we trace back, we find that it was uh, infection through parent or grandparent. So a lot of family spread. So that's what we have tended to see. We've had a couple of cases also where um, we've had staff members become positive and they have become positive through uh, exposure to spouse. Um, again, one of our recent cases that I just reported today, that's exactly what that was related to. One was related to spouse, one was related to a child. So um, we look at each individual case, obviously from a perspective of having to quarantine, uh, that is a phone call we don't like to have to make. Um, and the reality of it is going to be this, as we move to more in-person learning, we're gonna have more kids in a cohort. If I have a positive case in a classroom, the implication is gonna be, I may well have more kids and more staff having to be quarantined as a result. But we think that the, the trade-off, obviously, having kids in the building and having kids in classrooms, being able to reacclimate to the academics is critically important. So I appreciate it. Thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else with any questions for Mr. Emmett? Um, I just had a couple of questions. Um, one thing that I had heard that is a concern is uh, kids that are in daycare. Um, there could be a spread amongst family because of a child in daycare. Um, the child, you know, at, at that age may not, may be in, um, asymptomatic at that point, but um, 
presents at the house and, and gives it to a family member. Is there any concern that, you know, the younger grades, uh, elementary school grades, have kids, uh, siblings that are in daycare that maybe, um, you know, may put this, uh, um, you know, back to school for elementary students at, at risk? It, it, good question. Thank you, Mayor Rell. Uh, we have not seen uh, infection happen through daycare per se, it's, it's typically happened within the family structure. So it's, you know, a parent that's gone to work and the parent has gotten it at work and then brings it home. And it's just, it's inevitable. You're in close contact and you might not know that you're carrying that viral load. You may be in close contact with your family for a couple of days before you present symptoms. And in some cases we have cases where, you know, somebody tests positive and they don't have any symptoms at all. Therein lies the challenge. So that's where the mitigation strategies really become uh, critically important. So for example, if you know, you know you've been exposed to a positive case, quarantine. Let us know, let, let the nurse know, let the principal know and quarantine. The other piece that's critically important here, if you are sick, stay home. I cannot stress that enough. So I've had a couple of staff members, and I know staff members in Weathersfield, they wanna be in, they want to be teaching kids. They want to be focused on instruction. And we've had a couple of cases where we've had, you know, staff members that have come in and, you know, I just think I have a, 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 an allergy and it ends up being it's a positive case. So same holds true for students. Um, if your child is sick or if you are sick, you think you have symptoms, stay home. Uh, the testing protocol, thankfully, has gotten a lot better. Uh, earlier in the fall, we had a difficult time getting folks tested. Uh, because there was such a, a demand. Uh, that's become a lot less uh, of an issue at this point in time. So testing to be safe is certainly something that uh, we, we encourage. Okay. One-to-one um, -one with technology, all of our students, uh, you know, I, I don't, which, which grades do they start with Chromebooks? Um, is it first grade? Chromebook starts at grade three. We have iPads okay. for pre-K to two. That's what it was. Okay. Yep. Yep. And, and it's one to one. And yes. it, how are you looking with, um, you know, participation rate with uh, students uh, that are either full remote or, or the hybrid? Um, uh, are they still keeping up with their um, schoolwork by remote or have we seen a drop off in um, attendance? I think as we've seen more students go to full remote after the holiday season, we've seen an increase in the number of students that are not engaged. And again, I think that's one of the issues that pushes us to move in this direction and you know bring more kids back in. Uh, we have attendance committees at all of our schools. So if we've got students that are disengaged, uh, it's one of the things that our attendance committees follow up on. Uh, on remote Wednesdays, uh, when students are working remotely, I have our security staff from Weathersfield High School making home visits and actually visiting homes where we have students that have not engaged. Um, we have obviously through our, our Google platform and our GoGuardian platform, we can identify when students are not engaged uh, and can reach out through our social workers and our psychologists. So that is an ongoing issue. But I will say for the most part, our students are engaged. Um, I'm very appreciative of the fact that we were able to um, implement the one-to-one -one technology. I know there are multiple districts that continue to wait for Chromebook orders that they had placed last spring. Uh, the other thing that we've been able to do with our IT team, uh, Mayor Rell, is to uh, get funds through the Connecticut Connectivity uh, Program. So we were able to secure hotspots for families in need that did not have internet service. Um, so that we could make sure that these folks had the ability to be able to connect to their teachers and connect to their uh, education. Great. Um, and then you had just mentioned school psychologist and psychiatrist, and, and earlier you had mentioned SEL. Um, is there any feedback from staff on uh, the students, you know, SEL, and for those that don't know, social emotional learning, I mean, it, it is, uh, you know, key in the development of a you know, a um, well-rounded student, not only in the curriculum, but for those that are, you know, may need, you know, a little bit of extra help um, while they're in school. Um, has the SEL been, you know, improving or have you seen a decline in, you know, children's mental health and, and social well-being while, you know, full remote or, you know, on the hybrid? 
Yeah, I think that what you're seeing, especially with the older kids, you know, a day in the life at Weathersfield High School is, you know, it's socializing in the cafeteria. You know, we have a state of the art building there and we have a mere fraction of the number of students that we typically have. Um, and again, as I had said, that escalated around holiday time where more and more parents and more students opted to do the full remote. You know, what I like about going to Weathersfield High School and going to the cafeteria is it's a very social location. And, you know, it's, it's bustling with three, 350 kids and everybody's socializing and it's, it's a great place to be. And it's a great place to connect with kids. And what you're seeing now with all of the uh, mitigation strategies that have to be in place with the social distancing, to go into that cafeteria now, it is a stark difference from what it typically is. It's folding tables, you know, spread out six feet apart. It's one to two kids per table and that's it. Everybody has to sit in the same direction. The mask comes off while you eat, then the mask goes back on. It's, it's not normal. And, you know, I, I would say um, for me, it was really um, telling when we recently had a student focus group um, as we're working on selecting the next principal at Weathersfield High School as Mr. Moore is retiring. So we did a student focus group and asked uh, our student leaders, class officers for the grades about their, what they were looking for characteristics for um, a principal. And you know, one of the things they talked about is they're looking for somebody that can bring them back together, somebody that can rekindle the school spirit of which there was a lot of. And now at this point in time, everybody is really disconnected. So I think the social emotional learning piece is gonna be critically important to be able to re-engage kids. You know, our kindergarten kids, you know, they have yet to have an experience of fully being socialized. So how, how do we do that? We've got a lot of work ahead of us. We, we certainly do. Okay, and this is just one step getting into that direction. And, and then finally, um, you know, to to tie in with social emotional um, youth sports in particular um, interscholastic sports um, does play a, a significant role in a you know a student athletes uh, learning and um, you know we saw limited sports in the fall the most recent shutdown and as you'd said I think we're into phase one or phase two of the reopening of winter sports Hopefully, you know, going forward, you know, the kids who missed out on a spring season last year will have a, a spring um, season this year. Um, does do any of our school or any of our teams, are they um, co-ops at all? I, I remember our, our hockey team may have been an only co-op a couple of years back. I don't know if they're co-op anymore. They are not. We have our own team. We are the Weathersfield Eagles. Uh, last time I talked to Mr. Maltesi, we are 25 players strong. So we have our own team. So no worries about a co-op there. No worry. Okay. Because that is a concern with a lot of municipalities mm -hmm. and you know, the sharing of, you know, three or four towns, um, each bringing, you know, five to 10 kids from each town playing. And I know, I, I believe they are, you know, limiting the, the competition and, uh, you know, multiple towns, no tournaments mm -hmm. uh, staying within your division. So it looks like you know, Weathersfield is following that same path as well when it comes to sports and, and trying to keep it as limited as possible. That, that's correct. And we're also looking at those high risk sports that are not running. Uh, so for example, indoor track, uh, wrestling, uh, competitive cheer and dance are not allowed to run. So we're offering an alternative um, training program for each of those sports. Uh, we obviously wanna keep the kids engaged. So um, that is going to happen. And I also, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about the impact on our music and our arts programs. You know, I, I think about the uh, fall and the spring production. And, you know, last year we got to the point where we were able to get in a dress rehearsal before we ended up having to say that we had to cancel. So you know, beyond sports, there are a lot of extracurricular activities. And although our clubs are operating virtually uh, and our teachers are doing a great job with keeping the kids engaged, a lot of these extracurricular activities in the arts and sports are really, um, really impacted by this pandemic. So I'm certainly hopeful that the vaccine will, you know, start to have an impact and develop some herd immunity so we can get back to business as usual. Mm -hmm. If I'm not mistaken, last year's production was Fiddler on the Roof, if um, I believe correct. Uh, um, Mary Poppins, I believe. Oh, Mary Poppins. Okay. I, I had something on my calendar and I was planning on taking the, the family to it. And it was, uh, yeah, first week of March or, or so. 
and uh, you know we started to see the the uptick uh, at that point. And you're right, it's it's beyond just the learning, the uh, extracurricular. It's you know the band, um, choir, as well as uh, the performing arts. Um, you know, I, I'm I work with the Memorial Day Parade Committee, and we always enjoy the band um, mm -hmm. playing in the, the parade and just wondering, you know, if they'll be able to get a chance to do that again this year. So we're hoping. I certainly hope so. Okay. Does anybody else have any questions for either Mr. Emmett or Mr. Carey? Okay. I appreciate you guys taking time out of your night to come and talk to us about this. Um, it is something that, uh, I know is near and dear to a lot of people in town and glad to know it has the backing of uh, um, the Board of Ed as well as the uh, uh, administration to get these kids back to a full time, as close to a full time as possible. Thank you, sir. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Okay, have a good night. Okay. And we've got moving down the agenda. Um, yes, I'm, I'm happy to um, read this next proclamation. Uh, it is February 1st, uh, the first of um, the month of Black History Month. And, um, you know, Weathersfield has always been uh, a leader in, you know, cultural diversity. And uh, I think every uh, year we've been, uh, I've been on council, we've uh, um, celebrated Black History Month. In fact, last year, um, town manager and I were planning um, some events and uh, they got curtailed when uh, the beginning of COVID unfortunately interrupted some of our plans and we had to plan for uh, the, you know, how things were going to you know, move about in, in March. Um, but I would like to take this opportunity right now uh, on behalf of the town to read a proclamation um, celebrating Black History Month. Um, whereas Black History Month celebrates the many contributions and achievements made by African Americans to our economic, cultural, spiritual, and political development. And whereas this effort to raise awareness of African Americans contributions to civil civilization began in 1915 with the implementation of Carter G. Woodson resulting in a decade long discussion to become a week long celebration in 1926. And whereas Black History Week expanded to a month long celebration in 1976 through a proclamation issued by then President Gerald Ford to honor the too often neglected accomplishments of black Americans in every area of endeavor throughout our history. And whereas the observance of Black History Month calls our attention to the continued need to battle racism and build a society that lives up to its democratic ideals. And whereas the town of Wethersfield continues to be an inclusive community in which all citizens, past, present, and future are respected and recognized for their contributions and potential contributions to our community, the state, the country, and the world. Now, therefore, be it resolved, I join in honoring the history and contributions of African Americans in our community and beyond by recognizing February as Black History Month in the town of Wethersfield. Be it further resolved, as mayor, I encourage all citizens to celebrate the town's diverse heritage and culture and continue our efforts to create a world that is more just, peaceful, and prosperous for all. In witness thereof, I hereunto set my hand and caused the seal of the town of Wethersfield to be affixed this first day of February, 2021. Thank you for the opportunity to read that into the record. Continuing on with the agenda, is there anybody in the queue for public comment? Mr. Evans. Yep, we have one caller at this point, 860. Five six three six nine two three. And you have to hit star six to unmute yourself. Yep. yep. 
Uh, good evening. This is Robert Young from 20 Copper Mill Road. Uh, first of all, uh, Mayor, I'd like to thank you for, I, I know at the last meeting, which was on a Tuesday evening, I believe it was January 19th, 2021, uh, you took a break for an executive meeting during the meeting. And uh, you gave me a call when it was all over, and I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Uh, I did sit on sit in on your meeting after you made the phone call to me, and uh, uh, as 9:30 rolled along, I, I I I get up too early in the morning, so I had to leave. So I I, I regret leaving, but that's just the facts of life. Um, secondly, um, uh, at the last meeting as well, I had mentioned that I was still waiting for some FOI information. And uh, this Friday, I received it finally. So Mr. Mayor th and Mr. Manager, thank you for uh, sending that information to me. I'm sure I'll have some follow-ups. Also, at that last meeting on, uh, on January 19th, there was a lot of discussion that evening about, I guess you called it, um, um, criminal, an uptick in criminal activity with automobiles. And, and I think uh, uh, there was a, quite a bit of talk about that, and I was really amazed at some of the people who felt, didn't, didn't, didn't really feel that this was a wrong thing to do. It appeared to me as a, someone who was listening as though some of those people they couldn't care less if young people were stealing cars. It's just part of their nature at their age. And I, I just was flabbergasted over listening to these people talk, thinking that they live the same town as I do, and they vote the same way, and they vote as well, and they think like that. And, and I was really amazed and, and shocked that that kind of conversation was going on, how these young people who were rot stealing cars and tearing up the neighborhoods and whatnot, well, that's just part of their age. I, I just couldn't get it. I just don't get it. But uh, I really believe we need, and, and you know, I, I listened to some of your discussion after your uh, executive session, and, um, <clears throat> you know, we really need some strong laws, and, and I think that's probably where you were all headed, because we do, we are a, a nation or a state or a, a town of laws, and you know we have to respect other people as to their property, and we have to respect the the, the public property as well, and, and and live up to what we have to live up to, such as having a license in your pocket when you're driving an automobile. How many times do we hear about somebody got arrested because they didn't have a license, or they had the wrong license? I mean, a physical personal license. Then there's a lot of them you hear, they have a different license plate on their automobile. Again, another big offense. And a lot of people think that's okay. Well, there's, it's wrong. And, 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 and I, I just can't understand how people can think it's okay to drive a car with the wrong license plate, especially a stolen license plate on your car. Um, totally wrong, and uh, I mean the rest of us, the other 99% of us, 99 point whatever, we all do everything legal and we do everything in the way we should be doing it. Yet we have that very small minority of people, whoever they may be, who are, like I say, driving cars with the wrong license plates on it, driving cars without license plates, without a, a license in their pocket don't even own a license, that they haven't even bought a license from the state. Um, people riding bicycles, uh, those motorcycles, uh, what do they call them, trail bikes across people's yards and, 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 and on streets illegally. Uh, all that stuff needs to, you need to come down with a hard hand, Mayor. That's what I'm getting around to. We need to come down. We have so many other things out there to get young people involved. And it costs us a lot of money. And even though they get involved, they still get in trouble. So I really think we need to do something, Mayor, 
and, and stop all of this craziness and, and this stuff that we would call illegal activities. So please, uh, I, I know you were writing some letter to our state delegation, and I hope you emphasize that. Thank yes. you very much. We appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Young. Anybody else in the queue? We have one other number, 860-402-8087. If you wish to speak, please hit star six on your phone. State your name and address for the record. 860-402-8087. Um, we can hold off if this person's having difficulty star star six to unmute or if they're just listening in. Okay. Well we can always can you hear me? Oh yeah. Can you hear can you hear me? All right. I'm sorry about that guys. Uh good evening everybody. This is Shannon Roach, uh one zero four Surrey Drive. Uh was just calling and um, just really listening. Um, but uh, Mr. Young um, over there is uh, making some comments and uh, things. And I, and I feel that, you know, easy, this is constantly what's going on in our town is, is a kid bashing thing. And we need to realize that there are adults involved in this. There are adults leading this as well. Um, just in Newington, at the end of December, there was a man that was arrested for smashing windows, a grown man, 34 years old, um, for smashing windows in New Britain and things taken out of people's cars, and he got arrested. So this is not just uh, a child thing. This is not an adolescent thing. This is an everybody thing. And there are a lot of people taking advantage of opportunities um, that are going on in our town, in surrounding towns, and throughout the state and throughout the country. And we need to stop focusing on one part of it and focus on the large part of it. And that's the only way that we are going to start to combat things is when we realize that it is not just adolescents. It is a lot of people doing damage around here, and we need to be able to address that. I also think that if we're going to talk about um, getting these kids involved in something and uh, starting to do something, we need to start to look at maybe some mentorship uh, programs where uh, possibly adults, when it's possible, um, can might be willing to volunteer and work with some kids that might be at risk. Um, I was a child that was at risk. I went through a lot as a, as a young person. And if I didn't have an adult guidance figure there at one point in my life, I might not be on this phone call right now. I might be in jail. I might be dead because we can make a lot of wrong decisions when we don't have somebody there to guide us. And sometimes when we talk about the youth, we are not thinking about what may be going on in their homes and the guidance that they may not have there. So what are we going to do to offer some of that guidance? And I will be the first to say is that if you come up with a program like that, I would gladly volunteer for it. That's all I have to say, guys. Have a nice evening. Thank you, Mr. Roach. Yes, uh, you know, we, I plan on having a very open conversation with our delegation. You know, some members of the uh, council will be in that and uh, there's been some articles in the paper about uh, some other proposals that are out there by legislators so um, looking at uh, this uh, in totality and not just through a narrow lens so uh, I do appreciate your uh, uh, concern and um, you know I will definitely be taking that into consideration when we are um, talking to folks up in Hartford so thank you anybody else in the queue not at this time, Mayor. Okay. Um, hearings and ordinances, we do not have any. Uh, reports from boards or commissions tonight. Councilman Hill. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, last week, I attended the library board meeting. Um, they, uh, a lot of activity in the library board, as, as many know, uh, it actually reopens today, February 1st. Um, they, uh, they were closed due to, to a potential COVID exposure. Um, they couldn't successfully contact trace, so out of abundance of caution, they did 
uh, shut it down over by about a week or so. Um, they uh, are starting their beginning their internal budgeting process. Uh, they're on track right now with uh, spending their spending plan for the fiscal year. Um, they do have some um, uh, interesting proposals that they're looking at in the future. It's actually, uh, they're looking at bringing uh, kind of a walk in the woods kind of into their, looking at wintergreen or mill woods to go, um, basically you, like, like we had done with the historic commission with uh, the markers all across Old Weathersfield, by putting these markers in wintergreen woods and mill woods where you can read a book while you uh, take a hike, which I thought was an excellent uh, little project that they're looking at. Um, beyond that, they have uh, they were gifted about twelve thousand dollars by the Shulman Estate, uh, which now brings that up to about a three hundred thousand dollar gift that they've received so far from this estate um, since its inception. And also, the uh, we had a Brainerd Noise Committee meeting on Thursday, but uh, due to a lack of a quorum, we're going to have to reschedule for uh, sometime in the near future. And I would urge all council members to continue to kind of keep an eye out for anything regarding Brainerd as live action. Um, you know, regarding either runway expansion, you know, trees, you know, all, all that. So um, please stay tuned. Thank you. Thank you. And I think we have a meeting scheduled for later this week uh, to discuss uh, Brainerd. Oh. Yep. Thank you. Uh, Council, uh, Deputy Mayor. Yes, uh, I've attended uh, two of the Capital Improvements Advisory Committee meetings. Uh, for those who are not familiar with this, uh, we have four to five meetings, uh, a meeting uh, on Wednesdays uh, prior to uh, beginning work on our budget. And <clears throat> we listen to uh, presentations from most department heads um, and they submit their requests for capital items. Uh, this includes drainage, pavement, sidewalks, fire safety, library, town buildings and schools, parks and rec and community development. This year for 21-22 year, uh, we have requests totaling a little over $3.7 million. And in the next uh, two meetings, we will try to whittle that down or the committee will try to whittle that down to uh, somewhere in the range of $900,000. So obviously uh, requests uh, exceed uh, the funds that we have available to work with. So, uh, but uh, we've made some good headway so far. So looking forward to uh, Wednesday's meeting. Great, thank you. And Councilman Biggs, you had your hand up earlier, yep. Yes, good evening, Mayor, thank you. Um, I uh, attended the Historical Society um, meeting last week, um, went over a few things they are, they wanted me to encourage everyone to check out their virtual offerings on their website, including their virtual lantern light tours um, that they're currently promoting. Um, they have a vintage Valentine's display in the front windows of the Kini Center uh, that will be starting on February 4th. Um, so make sure everyone checks that out. Um, and then they also have a newsletter um, coming to everyone's mailboxes mid-February um, that will have a, a lot of great articles. Um, and that will also be available on their website. Um, additionally, um, the Bike and Pedestrian Committee uh, meeting, I attended that. Um, they are in the process of completing a plan um, of recommendations and projects um, to help uh, with some of, the pro some of the things going on around town. Um, they're near complete with that to present it up to us so we can have a look at it on some of the things they are proposing. Um, to, to better that for pedestrians and, and bike riders and whatnot. Um, their next meeting is actually gonna be on the 11th and I'll have further information to uh, provide you all for that. And that is all that I have, Mayor. Great, thanks, Councilman. Anybody else with any reports? Okay. Moving on now to discussion items, item A, one. Uh, paint and crack ceiling. And, you know, Gary, just for a reminder for folks, this is a workshop meeting. Um, so we can discuss um, these items. We don't have to vote on them tonight, correct? This is for discussion. Um, but before, you know, we bring either Derek or Sally in to talk about these, 
is is there anything that is time sensitive we may need to vote on tonight or can these be discussed tonight and voted on at the next meeting yeah and i th thank you mayor and to the council I, and i think derek and sally can confirm this but i i don't believe the first answer is yes this is a workshop meeting i actually um intentionally put it under discussion items rather than referral i do not believe we're time sensitive for this meeting is that correct <coughs> derek and sally I'm getting the nods, yes. Nods and thumbs up, yep. okay. Yep. For those who can't see oh, in TV land, um, they're muted and they said, yes, it's not time sensitive. Okay. Um, but what this uh, came from is over the last year, there's been a number of discussions from different council members bringing up the fact that the way our bidding currently happens, um, sometimes the council feels they're kind of like in between a rock and a hard place. We come to them and say, okay, now's the time you have to vote for this. And if we don't vote, we're kind of stuck in this limbo. And unfortunately that's the nature of the beast for some of these um, in particular uh, uh, in engineering as well in physical services. Sometimes those things just kind of come up and it is what it is because we're basing it off of someone else's bid. We're either piggybacking off of their bid um, or it's a, in the case of Sally's uh, for tonight as an example, um, it's part of the commodities market and it fluctuates up and down. So our reaction time um, is sometimes a little bit, um, needs to be quicker um, in order to capture the, the best value. There's probably no perfect system here, but what I wanted to start bringing forward to the council rather than just continuing to say, okay, well, at this meeting, I need you to vote for it, um, for or against it. Um, I wanted to try to create some time. Um, there's been a little bit of preliminary research, not a lot as to, um, you know, different ways we can approach this. I've had some conversation with Michael O'Neill, who's the finance director, also responsible for procurement of different ways we can do it. Um, it really boils down to two methods. Really, it's we're bidding it at this point, at least. Again, it's preliminary. Either we bid it out or we use a piggyback bid or, or, um, or with a consortium like a state bid or a CROG bid. So what um, Sally and Derek are doing today because they have two uh, projects that are coming up shortly or two items that need to be bid out shortly is they're kind of giving you a feel for um, what those are. This is just the beginning of the conversation. It's not meant to be all inclusive, although I'll credit where credit is due. Derek has worked on a presentation within like a very short period of time that we're, um, that we're kind of merging with Sally's um, to give some very detailed explanation as to th what those options look like and what the pricing might stru structure might look like. The difficulty that we're having, or I'm having, and from a financial standpoint we may have, is um, sometimes you don't know what you know until after it's too late. So you could bid something out thinking we're gonna get the best deal um, and the town bids it out as the responsible entity, but you don't have the ability to necessarily compare um, if you went with a consortium with like a CROG bid or, um, or a state bid. Unfortunately, kind of is, all right, well, we, we just bid it out and now we don't have a choice for the next year, we have to go with it. So what I'll let Derek kind of do and Sally can jump in and we'll kind of work off of it is maybe his presentation, go through it and we can answer some questions and help evolve the conversation more. And then I'll take it back and I'll work with the team here to kind of see how we can address some of the questions council has. So Derek, do you wanna bring it up or do you want me to do it? Um, let, me, let me try and if I have a problem, I'll ask you too. Okay, can everybody see that? Yes. Yes. Okay. All right, for the record, um, my name is Derek Reger. I'm the town engineer. Um, as town manager was saying, I'm here tonight with Sally Katz uh, to talk about our procurement practices for some of our annual programs. I'll be talking about what we do typically for engineering and then Sally will talk about physical services. So, Going to the first slide here. Um, this is, we're going to talk about some of the different uh, options that we have for procuring uh, work, whether it's procuring uh, materials or um, doing construction work. Uh, for our municipal bid process, this would be more of a traditional bid process. I'm just going to take you through the process real quick so you get an understanding. Um, I'm not familiar with everyone's knowledge about the topic, so I'm going to cover it briefly and then we'll get into some of the detail on the uh, pricing itself. 
Uh, so for municipal bids, town staff or a consultant typically will have to go through the process of developing construction plans and details, specifications, um, bid tabs, uh, product information, and, and other contract uh, documents that are required to issue a bid solicitation. Um, usually once we go through that, and the, the length of time that takes varies quite a bit depending on the type of project and the size of the project. Um, once we do that, the director of finance will review it and approve the solicitation. And then finance department will advertise the project. Um, we also do direct notices to contractors that have subscribed to get our bid information. And that process now, once we get to this point, typically we allow at least three to four weeks um, to give contractors enough time to digest all of that information and then be able to uh, provide submittals. So usually with a submittal, they'll provide us a bid form where they write in the price for every item that we're looking for information on. Um, to provide bidder qualifications, uh, references that get checked, um, a bid bond or certified check is required with their bid, certificates of insurance, uh, notarized affidavits, and also um, any questions during that process that they may have, which comes up um, frequently. If there's some something needs to be clarified, then staff will respond to that during the bidding process. So after those few weeks pass, after the bid opening, town staff or a consultant will evaluate the bill, bids. We look for things like unbalanced bidding, where they're bidding really high on an item or really low on an item um, with the thought of maybe there's a change order they expect's gonna be involved. Uh, missing information, uh, we check references. Uh, and depending on the type of agreement, a town attorney may be consultant before recommending award to council. So at that point, we come to town council for approval. Once town council approves it, we go back, we execute a contract uh, with them with whoever the selected uh, bidder is, and then we issue a purchase order. And that really starts the process. So that's the, the traditional bid process that we do on a number of our projects. For certain types of projects, we have other options where we can utilize um, existing state contracts or other bidding mechanisms that have been done. Um, so I'm gonna just explain those briefly. Uh, one option is uh, Capital Region Council of Governments, CROG. They do bid solicitations annually for different types of projects. Um, as you probably are aware, we're a member of uh, that organization. They were initially formed to implement regional programs that benefit, uh, benefit benefited towns throughout the region and the region as a whole. Um, CROG participates in what's called the Capital Region Purchasing Council that includes over 100 different towns. Um, it was created for recreational procurement of common goods and services and the idea was with that is to save member towns money and time and to create efficiencies in the process. So everyone's not bidding out the same type of work and then having to um, you know, go through the process I just explained. It, it streamlines it, it makes it billable to others. Typically for at least the projects I deal with, they only solicit bid pricing. With, with that program, they don't actually create contracts. So for us to utilize it, we can review what's available, what the bid prices were, um, you know, look at there's, there's a low bidder usually for everything. So we could look at using the low bidder if we're comfortable using them. Then all we need to do is execute a contract with them and issue a purchase order and we can start the process. They go through a competitive bid prices process like we would. So they're looking at getting prices from multiple contractors and the number of contractors that bid, you know, depends on the project and the type of work that's being done. That process will save town staff time and as well as contractor time compared to the previous process I mentioned, because there's a lot less steps involved. They've already, they have already done that on some level with CROG and we can go step in, see what they've submitted. It's all been done for us. And at that point we can decide if we wanna move forward with them. It really expedites the process, uh, particularly with construction, sometimes schedule, weather, time of year is gonna factor in. And, and if we can move a, pro a project along quickly and get it done in a certain time frame, it may avoid holding up other projects. Um, so sometimes that's beneficial to us versus the traditional process that's going to be more time consuming. Another option that we utilize is state contracts through the Connecticut Department of Administrative Services. They solicit bids and proposals and they execute construction and purchasing contracts that are used by Department of Transportation and other state agencies. Um, as part of that process, municipalities are able, if it's allowed in their charters, to utilize those contracts that are already in place to retain contractors or vendors. And that is without the need of us going through a solicitation or a contract process. So we basically can just utilize the contract that's already in place. 
Um, that requires us to only need to issue a purchase order. I mean, normally we'll require them to provide us with certificates of insurance and those types of things um, that are pretty easy for them to give us. But really, it's so really on our end, we just got to review it. We're comfortable with the pricing um, and the contractor. We can check references if we want to. And then we move forward with issuing a purchase order for them. This is the most efficient option for us when it's available. It's not available for all types of projects, um, but a lot of the maintenance type of work that we do, particularly talking about the paving program, crack sealing, that is something uh, they have contracts on um, and we can utilize them. So it's the most efficient process for both us and for the contractors. And now I'm gonna just talk a little bit more about the particular programs that we utilize on an annual basis. So um, when I was talking to the town manager last week about coming in tonight to talk about this, I sent out a request to a number of public works agencies through the Yukon listserv. And I was asking them just to give me some feedback on what programs are they using for their programs? Uh, because every town's doing, usually doing a paving program, a crack seal port program and a pavement marking program uh, annually. So in the, in the few days I had, I, I've got a response from nine different towns that you can see in the left column. And then the all the columns are for the different programs that we have. So as you can see under the paving program, uh, eight of the nine uh, utilize the state bid. Um, and you see at the bottom, Weathersfield, we use the state bid as well. So that's very common. Um, the work is very standardized throughout the region. And I'll show you uh, how the regions work um, as far as the sectors and how pricing works there. But a lot of municipalities do use it for the paving program. Okay. Also, crack seal program, you can see it's more of a mix. Um, some use a local COG bid. Uh, elders use local bids and, and some um, do it themselves. So some towns have the, you know, the equipment to be able to do it. So it's kind of a mix there, um, but there's not many that are doing, going out and getting local bids. Most of them are either doing it themselves or going out to COG. Uh, as far as pavement markings, um, similarly, uh, there's some that do a local bid, others that use the COG bid. Um, or state bid. For us, as shown in the bottom, paving program is typically state bid, crack seal program. Um, we usually use uh, the COG, which is just another acronym for, for CROG. It's a council of governments, but it's more generic because there's multiple ones throughout the state. So we'll usually use the CROG bid for that. Um, one of the reasons is we use a particular uh, type of sealant that has polymer uh, fibers in it that is more resilient and lasts longer. Um, it's very commonly used. The state hasn't adopted that for some of their work, just given the type of work that they're doing. So um, often CROG will put out a bid that includes that as a bid item. So for those municipalities that utilize that material, they have it available. Um, for the paving, uh, pavement marking program, similarly, DOT uses epoxy resin pavement markings, which are more of the uh, plastic um, raised type that are much more expensive. Um, we typically don't use that, a lot of municipalities don't. It's, it seems to be uh, more cost effective for us to pave them, uh, to paint them on an annual basis. So we, we don't, DOT doesn't have that available to us to look at for contracts, but we do have a crowd that's available and they do utilize that and a lot of towns, um, you know, jump in and, and use it as well. So I'll go to the next slide here. And I was talking about sections of the state so for DOT contracts, when they put out a bid like they want to solicit pricing for bituminous concrete for paving operations, they break it up into different uh, sections of the state. We are in section 13, as you can see highlighted in the middle of the screen and Weathersfield highlighted uh, in more of yellow. Um, they get pricing for those areas. So when contractors are bidding, they consider where they are located geographically and what makes sense for them. So they may bid on multiple sections of the state but they may bid higher if they got to travel a half hour, an hour to get to where they're going versus if they're 10 or 15 minutes away. So it gives bidders an opportunity, depending on where they are, um, be competitive in their own region. And as you can see, it kind of runs from <clears throat> Hartford and most of Hartford anyway, down to Durham at the south end and Wolcott to the west and Glastonbury to the east. So it's, it's a pretty narrow area. And for us, you know, we will get a number of bidders that usually will bid being central to the state. We have a lot of uh, options as far as um, material suppliers and pavers. This here is showing uh, our an assessment of our, our paving program and also what I was able to get information on some other municipalities that have posted their bid results online. So this was 
looking, uh, if you look at the left column, these are different, different agencies and their contracts and then moving to the right, the bid opening dates. So these were all 2020, there's one in fall 2019. So I'm trying to compare prices for what we spent last year on our paving program in 2020 versus what other towns have spent that did not utilize a state contract and rather put it out a project to bid. These quantities are roughly the same for their projects and for ours. I looked at the tonnages that they're using. So, um, you know, it's, 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 it's comparable to our paving program and what we'd be doing. Um, Next column just shows number of bidders, and then we get into uh, the materials themselves. So you see three columns with HMA, which is the acronym for hot mix asphalt. Um, just briefly, the S0.375 is stone size. So 0.375, si uh, excuse me, 0.375 means that the average stone size is three eighths of an inch. Moving to the right, HMA S0.5 is half inch and then one inch. So we utilize um, different stone sizes depending on type of traffic we're going to have on the road and the thickness of the lifts that we're putting down. So just to look at the first column for HMA S0.375, there were a couple of these towns um, that had utilized that material. One of them was Manchester. They got a tonnage price of $81 a ton. The one on the bottom there is Weathersfield. That was our lot project we just finished this fall, which was a good amount of paving. And that was uh, $86 a ton. That's not the low, these aren't necessarily the lowest bidder that got the job. This is just the lowest bid price they got from these five or six bidders that bid on the project. Some of them didn't get the project, but they were low bidder on this, these particular items. They just were high on other items and didn't get the job. So going down to what's in the box, you can see the state bid that we had last year that DOT has decided to extend into 2021. So we're gonna have the same pricing that we had last year. There were five bidders in our region, $66.40 or the same material. So that's on a per ton basis. Similarly, if you go to the next column for the HMA S0.5, you can see the range there. We're looking at about $69. The lowest price I could see in that range is 78. S1.0, uh, lowest price on a couple of the projects that had it was 79, we're paying about 75.35. So you can see if we look at down below, it says percent savings, I'm comparing our pricing that we utilized last year and would be available to us this year compared to the lowest bids I could get out of the information I have. I understand it's a, it's a limited amount, but on short notice, that was the best I can come up with just to try and give you some of an idea of what even we experienced with our Highland Street project just recently on what the, what the costs are. And they're usually going to be higher because there's not this economy of scale that when a bidder puts in for a state project, they understand they're gonna be getting a lot of work A from the state and B, a lot of municipalities will tack on um, piggyback off their contract and they, they can do it for less typically. That's not a 100% of the time, um, but usually based on my experience, that is uh, a program that's beneficial, particularly in the paving arena, like we saw in the earlier slide, most of the towns I contacted um, were, were using it. So I tried to put those into dollars for us. So I looked at, what the low bid was for each one of those items for these other contracts and what we pay at the state. You can see there's an 18%, 12%, 5% savings. For what we spent on our paving program this past year, spring and fall program, we spent about $1.6 million. That would have equated to about $9,800,000 $100, worth of savings that had we, in this particular instance, put it out to bid, potentially we could have been paying that much more. So we got that much more road work done um, as part of our program. So that is what we typically do for, uh, for our paving work. Um, I was going to look at now uh, capital region. So this, this map here shows uh, different COGS throughout the state. We, we are in the capital region council of governments, which is there in the north central area of the state. When they do bid prices, it applies not only to Krog, but it also, um, that, that region for the purchasing council actually extends beyond Krog. There's more towns involved in participating. In it. So similar to what I was showing you on the last slide, this is what we would be looking at for crack sealing. Um, as I showed you in the first slide, there's not a lot of towns that actually do a local bid. I did find Middlebury had put out a bid last year and uh, they were, that was a similar type of program. They put it out in June. You can see the three bidders over on the right for the polymer crum crumb rubber modified sealant. That's the PCRM that we typically use. They're using it as well. You can see the three bids of $1.40, $1.44, and $1.60. 
We look down at the crack, uh, crack bid for crack sealing in the, uh, in the box that was from last fall, which is good through this coming fall and would, could be utilized this year for our work on the same thing on a per pound basis, $1.25 a pound. So it's about 11% savings from the low bidder that Middlebury got for a similar type of application of a similar product. Um, so for us, you know, we typically spend $100,000 a year on our uh, crack seal program. And so that would be a savings of approximately ten, eleven thousand dollars. So, you know, with that, it allows us to certainly get more done. Um, I know that at the bottom, we pay on a per gallon basis. It's easier for us to track than rather per pound. Um, but the ratios are approximately the same if you're looking at per pound or per gallon. They just happen to bid theirs per pound. So I looked at the Krog bid because Krog will bid it um, per lineal foot of road per pound or per gallon, and you can choose which option you, you want to use for tracking and, uh, and payment purposes. All right, so I'll uh, turn this over to Sally now. This is her information and she can step in. Basically, a lot of what Derek had just mentioned is similar for the way that we would go out and purchase fuel. We can, um, there are companies that put their pricing on a state bid contract as far as their pricing for fuel is two, um, two parts. There is the price per gallon and then the differential price, which each company adds per gallon um, as kind of their markup. And so there is a state contract which would show the markup. Um, and then we also, and then Krog will go out to bid that Krog works with a commodities firm uh, in, that does research into the commodities market. And they go out to bid for things like home he heating oil, diesel fuel, and gas, very similar to the way Derek was saying. Um, they go out once a year for the pricing for diesel. They, Krog has found over the past few years that the lowest diesel prices are usually available around this time, January, February. However, once they get a locked in price, the contract does not begin until July 1. And so the vendors are locking themselves in for something that's not going to happen until uh, five months from now. Um, what currently there are approximately um, 36 towns that have expressed interest to work with Krog on the diesel bid. And that will be going out, as I said, very soon. We, we also have the opportunity if we want to not participate with Krog and to go out and to utilize um, the state contracts. Many of the people, Standard, East River, Dime, um, will be under contract with the state, but also will participate in the Krog bid. Right now, currently, we are with Dime Oil um, for diesel. And we do um, tell them that we would, we would write a contract or sign a contract for 32,000 gallons of oil of, excuse me, of diesel fuel, number two. And so what you're looking at here, if I can just add in the comparison of three. So very similar to Derek, um, it was that idea of let's go out and research. Um, we actually engaged CCM to see if they could pull some information. Usually with CCM, um, we have a relatively quick turn time, um, but this requires um, kind of the timing of municipalities to get back. There's a number of municipalities that use um, uh, state or uh, council of government bids. So you have to wait for responses. I think Sally and I were able to find these online just by doing a Google search. So you had Ridgefield, which um, had 145,000 gallon request. And again, when you're looking at a, a COG or, um, or a state bid, you're looking at the volume, you're looking at um, I keep wanting to call it value engineering, but it's, um, you know, you're, you're buying in mass quantities. So that really helps drive down the price. So we picked Ridgefield, which was accessible um, very quickly to get the bid results from the same time period as when we went out for our Krog bid last year. 
just to see what they were paying. And then we were able to, Sally was able to find Woodbridge, which is approximately 28,000 gallons. That was really close to our 32,000 gallons. And again, we bought ours as part of Krog. Um, and I can't remember the total gallons that they had, but you're looking at 32 or 36 municipalities. So it's a much larger quantity. Um, but I thought it was important to put a small one in there that went on their own and a large one that went on their own just to see. And if you look carefully, and I know Derek has access to the control, but Dime Oil is the winning bidder for Ridgefield. They paid $1.94 per gallon, and that's at 145,000 gallons. When we did the Krog bid, we're, what's that, about 11 cents under that, um, even though we're only at 32,000 gallons because we're able to take advantage of the, the mass quantity. Um, at the same time, you have Woodbridge at 28,000 gallons um, who paid 26 cents more. Double check my math. If anyone's got a calculator, I'm kind of eyeballing it. 30 gallon, 30, 25 to 30 cents more per gallon when they went out on their own. Um, as I said at the beginning, what we're trying to do is gauge um, as many examples as we can just to, you know, I don't know how many years I'll be able to go back, but if I could go back three to five years and see if maybe if I can find people bidding it out at the same time, I might be able to make the council feel comfortable with the fact that buying as part of a consortium is, is, uh, is, is less risky than purchasing it on our own. Um, I don't know it to be true. The problem is you don't find out until after you've already done the bid. So I tried to grab something quickly um, and uh, I'll provide more as we go. And I don't think there's anything. Is there another slide after this, Derek? I think that was it. Just questions if anybody has them. Great. Um, th thank you, Derek. Uh, if you can stop the screen share real quick. Get everybody so I can see if anybody's up there. Um, this is very useful. Um, well done. Uh, very appreciative that uh, that you did this. Uh, any questions for uh, either Derek or Sally for this presentation? Councilwoman Pelletier. I I just just about that last slide, and you don't have to put it up again. Um, I know how you mentioned how you found Ridgefield and Woodbridge. They're just kind of random um, compared to the other slides that were sort of our neighboring towns. And um, so I just wanted to clarify, it was it just because they were, it was hard to find the information and you just happen to find these or, I just wanna make sure they aren't handpicked to, to sort of illustrate the broader point, that's all. Yeah, I'll be, yeah I'll just be like to know, um, Rocky Hill, Cromwell, Newington, our surrounding towns are actually um, purchased off the Krog bid. Okay. Yeah, I'll be, I, it was a Google search. Okay. <laughs> because it, it's just, there's 169 municipalities. And so whatever started coming up on Google, I'd try it different things, whatever I could get for tabulation. Um, I can't, I was able to find older. Yes. But not many for like the last year. Right. right. 15, 16, 16, 17, 17, 18 all came up, but 2021, I don't know if they just stopped posting them. Um, I remember Sally making the joke, you know, isn't this transparency in government? Aren't we supposed to be posting this information? Yeah. Um, but a lot of them, as I said, our, our neighboring towns uh, along, you know, into Avon, Farmington or are, are all going with Krog. Okay, thank you. Yeah, no, it's, a, it's a good question. And again, I'll, we'll do our best to see if we can shake more out just so you, you have a, a better breadth of, um, of options or comparisons. <coughs> And Gary, just real quick, are we, um, are municipalities required to be a member of a, a COG or I guess a, a COG? I, I don't think there's a requirement. Um, a lot of them do sign in um, just because it gives you access to additional things for competitive purposes. Um, but I don't think, I mean, COG doesn't have a requirement on us to be a part of it, um, although we do benefit from being a part of it, mm -hmm. right? So I think we're sitting on, I don't even wanna say, but at least $3 million, possibly more of grant funds that we're able to competitively access through CROG, which came from the state, might even be closer to four, um, that we wouldn't have other been, otherwise been able to compete 
um, on our own as successfully against. Um, I can say in other municipalities that I've worked for, CROG has been very helpful in accessing brownfield funding that we wouldn't have been able to get, and those were larger municipalities. So there's benefits to being uh, in partnership with them. Um, and, and working okay. with them. And again, they, for example, you know, in Sally's case, um, and, and I know Derek's on committees there, so he might be able to expound as well, but in the case of what Sally's working on, you're going to have a dedicated consultant who understands the commodities market, who's out there kind of providing advice um, as part of what we're paying, where I will say we have very talented staff here. I'm not sure if any of them understand commodities, and if they do, we're going to have a separate conversation for maybe where I need to put some investments, so... Gotcha. Okay, thank you. Anybody else with any questions? Mr. Deputy Mayor. On uh, when, Sally, when we purchase fuel, uh, are we obligated to purchase the 32,000 gallons or whatever it was? Or do we just say we're going to buy all the fuel that we need during the season through that contract? What we do is we track how much we've used over the, over the past few years. And so when we commit to that number, that is our commitment in previous years when um, there was a need from other places, however, a shortage due to global instability, they had uh, made us offers that anything that we were not going to use, they would buy back. Uh, but that has not happened in the past three or four years. The same would hold true if you didn't use as much as we anticipated. We, uh, we uh, yeah. buy it from. Yeah. We lock, uh, otherwise, no, we would we would lock in, um, and because of because of the way that we've tracked it over the past few years, we have been very close uh, okay. in our consumption and with having a six thousand gallon tank, that does give us that leeway a little bit, but we've been very close and we have actually decreased the amount of diesel that we've been buying over the years as our tracking has gotten better. Thanks. Um, the only other thing I wanted to just make a comment, um, we pay a significant amount of money uh, to Krog and uh, CCM, I believe. And uh, I'd like to see that we take advantage of uh, purchasing through those two agencies uh, as long as we're paying them all that money anyway. So just my, uh, on the pavement side, uh, the numbers seem, you know, very clear. It's almost a no brainer that, you know, of how we should bid that and save our staff all the time and effort of uh, soliciting bids. I know the, Fuel side was a little bit less information, but I still think uh, that's the way to go. Thank you. Um, just a, a question, a first for Sally. Do we um, purchase any heating oil at all for the town still? Very, very little, very little. Um, okay. Because we've gone to mostly natural gas in our buildings. Okay. Is that a separate bid or is that part of the dime oil bid? It's um, when we've, when we've gone to it, it's been so low that we've just gone out on a separate bid. Gotcha. Okay. We are, as I said, when in our buildings were natural gas. So we're very fortunate in that. Good. Um, and then finally, uh, Derek, with the region 13 uh, for our area, do we have um, asphalt batching plants close by and um, the construction uh, companies close by that typically do the work in our town off of the, the state bid? Yes, we do. Um, Tilcon, who we've used for a number of years because they have been the low bidder, uh, has a plan in Newington, uh, which is close. Um, there are other pavement suppliers and pavers that work in the area, but generally, um, they're within a half hour of town, so and that's usually what we're looking for anyway for getting the material to the site while it's still hot, has to be placed at a certain temperature. 
and uh, the longer it sits, obviously, the cooler it gets. So, yes, uh, uh, and generally, like I was saying, um, those particular suppliers or pavers in a certain area are going to probably be more competitive than those that are traveling further for gas fuel costs and a number of other reasons. So, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else for any questions? This was a really useful uh, presentation. Thank you so much for putting it together for us. I know there had been some questions in the past on this, um, and uh, hopefully it cleared up some things for us. And you know, definitely keep this into consideration when uh, bids are uh, on the horizon. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. And Sally, please give our best to uh, the crew who Hi. I. I believe are, are going to be out all yes. night, night again. And, um, you know, I, I just got a text uh, that they are going to uh, go straight until the morning and uh, rest tomorrow. So yeah. um, please give my best to everybody and uh, have them be safe out there. We certainly will. And, and thank you all for your time and, and for the cruise. And also um, he left, but Mr. Emmett um, going remote tomorrow will certainly help the schools um, our crews be able to get into the schools to clear <coughs> the and sidewalks, parking lots. Um, I would just overall for anyone listening for people to please stay safe, stay off the roads if they can. If they see a plow truck coming, especially now that it's nighttime, it, a lot of people try to go out when it's dark and clear their driveways and sidewalks to just really please be careful. Um, when they're doing that, as crews will be out all night and it's absolutely safety first. We don't want anyone getting hurt during this storm. Appreciate that. Yeah. And our first responders who need the highway and need the roadways tonight. Um, God willing that they don't, but uh, um, if they do, thank you for clearing it. Okay. Anybody else with any questions or anything going forward? Thank you, Derek and, and Sally, appreciate that. Okay, have a good night. Good night, thank you. Thank you. Uh, moving down to uh, item B, council action. I don't believe we have any uh, items for referral to the regular agenda for uh, two weeks from now. Um, and I believe deputy mayor has some resignations and appointments for us. Um, and I think there are some walk-ins as well. Uh, that Sue had emailed to us uh, earlier today. Yep. Make a motion to accept the resignation of Stuart Temple, 317 Brimfield Road from the Capital Improvements Advisory Committee, uh, effective January 20th, 2021. Um, his term was 7 6 20 to 6 30 22. I'll move. Moved by O'Connor, seconded by Biggs. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Aye. Ayes have it. Okay. Um, I think P and Z has an appointment. You have a number of appointments. Uh, the Planning and Zoning Commission, it's an alternate to fill a vacancy. Korkatovic, uh, 86 Saxon Road, uh, term of 2121 to 63023. And then I have a number of appointments to the Weathersfield Heritage Commission. Uh, Executive Director of Historical Society, Amy Wittorf, uh, 17 Center Street, 2121 to 63024. Executive Director of Webb Dean Stevens Museum, Joshua Torrance, 33 Golf Road, 2121 to 63024. Uh, member of the Old Weathersfield Shopkeepers Association, Melinda Robido, 263 Hartford Avenue, 2121 to 63024. Uh, resident of Weathersfield, Christine Trazak. 125 Cedar Street, 2121, 63024. Member of the Economic Development and Improvement Commission, Judy Keene, 126 Broad Street, 2121 to 63024. 
a representative of the Westfield Historic District Commission, Damian Crago, 493 Main Street, 2121624, and our town government staff representative, Peter Gillespie, town planner. Okay. Motion, anybody make a motion? So moved. Okay, O'Connor and Pentelo, motion and seconded. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Ayes have it. Motion carries. Okay, continuing down, um, I believe regular minutes for the January 19th meeting. Um, everybody had had time to take a look at those. If there's any corrections or any, <clears throat> noted any absences or anything. If not, can I get a motion to approve the minutes of January 19th? So moved. Second. Moved and seconded, O'Connor and Biggs, Sue. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed nay. Ayes have it, uh, meetings are adopted. Okay, and we've got back to uh, the public comments section. Gary, if we've got anybody waiting. Yep, first caller, 860-563-6923. Again, oops, 860-563-6923. Please press star six to unmute yourself. We'll give them a little while longer. I don't know if there's a, a, it seems like there may be a little bit of a lag tonight. Yep, there we go. Hello, are you open for a comment? Yes, we are, Mr. Young. Um, it didn't seem like you, ran, you, you didn't mention telephone numbers and uh, ready to talk. I didn't hear that. Maybe something happened to our uh, audio piece. Okay, um, I, I, I don't have a lot to say uh, for the second section except for uh, tonight you came out with a uh, Black History Month, and uh, um, I was just wondering: do we have a do we have a a month to honor hardworking taxpayers in Weathersfield? You know, we hardworking. Hardworking taxpayers are normally overlooked and underappreciated by our town officials, and 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 I would think that we we probably should have at least a six month period to be honored, since we pay our tax bills every on a regular basis, uh, whether we pay it willingly or under duress, we have to pay it. But I would think that you know you should uh, do something you know, instead of uh, designating uh, February for Black History Month, um, you should do something like that for the taxpayer. Um, you know we work hard, we pay. In my case, I don't want to pay, but I have to pay. Uh, you hold a hammer over all of us, and. And, and, you know, I, I really think there should be a month, there should be six months that you should be honoring us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Young. And uh, while I concur um, about the taxpayers, uh, that presentation by uh, both uh, Derek Greger and Sally Katz um, did show that uh, the town is doing their best to get the lowest bidder for, uh, for projects and for uh, um, either uh, electricity fuels or, or any of our utilities. So um, I know for a fact that this council has uh, the taxpayer in mind. Um, we are all taxpayers. So um, 
we got that hammer over our head every six months as well. So I appreciate the comments. Um, anybody else, Mr. Evans? That is the only phone number. Nope, we're good. Okay, great. Um, no executive session tonight. So if I can get a motion to adjourn. So moved. A second. 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 All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Okay. Thank you, everybody. Be careful out there. Have a good night. Yes. Good night. Night.